My name is Majid Rahnema, and uh, I, some of you may know me because I taught one year here uh, a couple of years ago. Now I am retired. And uh, strangely, uh, perhaps now things as, as I see, uh, I met Stefan Essel when uh, something very strange had happened in my country. I was no longer, I was in the government of Iran. I was Minister of Science and Higher Education, and I had resigned from uh, the government. And then uh, uh, the French government took for the first time the, this initiative that was uh, the first in the probably history of the United Nations to present a candidate. And it, 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 it was the, the fight between uh, Kurt Waldheim and Mr. Jacobson. And uh, at, at that time, uh, there was a veto uh, from both sides. So none of them could, uh, uh, could become president. So the French government took the initiative of proposing my candidacy for uh, as a kind of uh, a dark horse. <laughs> and I remember uh, a, f a French ambassador, Monsieur Léon Brasseur, who took this initiative of uh, making a small lunch with Mr. Stéphane Essel here uh, and myself and asking you know, what, what could be our plans eventually if the dark horse would come out. But uh, I say all this because uh, since then, well, obviously, uh, this thing did not happen because, unfortunately, because I had resigned from the government, the, the Shah was very angry. And uh, apparently, he had said not only uh, we have no candidates from Iran, but we uh, are opposed. And uh, the day, the day finally, France took the initiative and put my name on, on the Security Council. At that moment, the Shah just before uh, gave instructions that if uh, there, there, there would be in the council some someone voting for me, this would be an unfriendly action towards him. All this it is the first time I'm saying this in public. And we had a lunch together, and we, we dreamt of the world. It's, it's the, f uh, the second time after that that I'm seeing uh, personally uh, our dear friend Stefan Essel. And I'm absolutely amazed by his memory first, and all the things that he said and he does. And I'm really proud to see that uh, he's, uh, he's been so well and so well inspired. And I should say that I, I'm, I don't live here. I live in Lyon. And it was difficult for me to, uh, to, to come, but I, want, I did not want to miss this occasion. Now, the only thing I want to say, with your permission, I'm absolutely in agreement with everything he does. And I'm always amazed, like today, what a memory he has. Because although I think I'm a little bit, a little bit, just two, three years uh, younger than him, Yes, this one? Yeah. Okay. So uh, the, this, this, what I think today I've come to, uh, to believe is that, yes, governments, of course, may do a lot of things. But we, ha we have been witnessing here this year in, the, in Europe that uh, three governments who had been democratically elected have found, finally, to leave because the market that did not want them. I'm not necessary for all of them, but you have the Italy, Ireland, and uh, Greece. Now, the force of the market and money has forced democratic governments to resign. So I don't think personally that only making governments a little bit, improving governments would be uh, uh, the, the answer. I mean, you couldn't, uh, we in Iran probably hope, would hope for something much less than that to, uh, to have some representatives in the government. But 
uh, in these countries, you have absolute democracy the way one can have them, but still the market is too strong to, uh, to accept that. Now, is it, should, we, should we leave that? I don't think, of course, because governments are very important. But I think there is an expression that Deleuze uses, uh, the multitude or the multiplicity, the mu multiple. Now we have to act on a multiple level. Everyone is responsible. Because I don't think that any longer market allows people to be free. The other day, M Marshall said, 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 said well, uh, I think uh, I better finish. But I hope anyhow, I hope anyhow, I'm not going to make a speech, but this is very bad. Uh, we have the habit of m the mullahs, you know, who just uh, <laughs> get, get excited. But I'm, I'm really very proud, very proud to be among these people. Come back to this American university where also my nephew uh, is teaching. I'm also very proud of him. <laughs> so, now, uh, I, I only think that you succeed, but I really my appeal is that really the Gandhian call, be the change you want to make possible. I mean, if each one of us in our territory can, through multiple actions, do something in order to uh, m make free people have what they want, then I think uh, we have done much. Thank you very much. I, I'm uh, Hall Gardner, uh, chair of the International Comparative Politics Department here at AUP. And I tell a story too. I had the honor of speaking with Stefan Hessel at the World Political Forum in November 2008, invited by Mikhail Gorbachev. And we spoke uh, on the human rights issue, the, uh, what's that, the anniversary. My question, though, is more directed towards the reform of the United Nations. I think you're absolutely right, we can't, I, I was just listening to Ron Paul, the isolationist, denouncing the UN as much as I respect some of his, his uh, anti-war uh, positions, but I was really upset when he sort of said we should just jump, dump the UN altogether and that we shouldn't follow UN resolutions. But I was wondering what kind of reform you might be speaking of. For example, in the 90s, we had a number of reforms proposed, bringing on Japan, Brazil, uh, maybe South Africa, um, uh, uh, Germany. Uh, those reforms, those proposals seem to go nowhere. And the other question is, in, in r related to just what was just said, to what extent can people begin to an impact upon the UN? Is it possible to have sort of a, a world, a popular assembly that would be aside the general assembly and and as well as the UN Security Council. And how should the UN, my basic question is, how should the UN Security Council be reformed? Should we abolish the veto? Should we form a, uh, I've been thinking of forming uh, regional councils as opposed to individual nas national councils. So I just wanted to see what your, your kind of thinking on that subject would be. Thank, Thank you very you much. much. I'm just visiting from Australia, from the University of Melbourne, and uh, I came across um, Stefan Hessel, whom I've read actually in English uh, in Melbourne, in Australia. Uh, I, I got to know uh, that this lecture was on. Uh, I was quite interested uh, in what you were saying about the ecological crisis, because um, about a month ago, I've just been to Tasmania, which is fairly close to where I live. And uh, at the moment, um, there is a struggle going on where the only temperate rainforest is under threat because uh, a number of companies have moved in um, a kind of an Asian conglomerate. It was owned previously by an Australian company, uh, which couldn't do all the logging and chopping down of these forests, but now it looks like they might do it. And um, a lot of the local politicians um, are supporting this because they're claiming that it provides jobs uh, for local people. And, um, it's it's going to be an environmental disaster, and I also want to do this gas seam uh, extraction. And um, well, you know, it's it's a question of we are facing a huge ecological crisis apart from uh, other crises like the economic crisis. And uh, I'm just wondering when you look at uh, the kind of parochial issues that politicians are uh, locally concerned 
about, and you know, I'm witnessing this here in France as well with Sarkozy. We've got politicians like this in Australia as well. Uh, and they do not ask any of the big questions, any of the questions that really you've mentioned, which really threaten the very survival of humanity. Thank you very much. You have Shall we start three, different three different issues. Well, let me first express my old friendship to Mr. Renema, because if we had succeeded then, we would have had a very good Secretary General of the United Nations and he would have brought to that organization the wisdom of the great civilizations of our world, among which a particular place belongs to the Parsi, to the Persian, to the Iranian culture, which has brought so much to all our countries. So please accept my, again, my respect for what you were representing at the time and my regret that we did not achieve what we wanted to achieve. Uh, let me now turn to a question that is very close to my heart and has been so for about 40 years now, the reform, the possible reform of the United Nations. I have already told you that I was terribly uh, impressed, uh, greatly impressed by the way in which Franklin Roosevelt organized the United Nations. And I still say to all critics of the United Nations that it is a blessing for us that this organization exists. And even if we have many reasons to be critical, we have also many reasons to be extremely thankful because what has been done uh, by the United Nations uh, and its various organizations, the ILO, the WHO, the WTO, etc., is something which has made our world more, uh, more uh, organized than it has ever been before in all times of human life. But the dangers are there because some of the problems that are fundamental are not being, uh, being solved by the United Nations. When I first started to think about this, it was 20 years after the Charter. That was the first time when I said, we must have a revision, reform of the Charter. It, it went nowhere. Then 20 years later, again, at one time I was sitting with a group chaired by a marvelous French politician, uh, German politician, Richard von Weizsäcker, a, a great German president. And this little group of nine tried to work out what reforms were possible for the United Nations. The more I think of it, uh, the more I feel, feel that uh, uh, it is not only the reform of the Security Council. Obviously, what one reads in the newspapers about blocking blockages comes from the veto power of the five uh, um, permanent members and they say, well, as long as the veto is there, the Security Council cannot overcome some of its most, most important problems. Right, and therefore we must think of a reform of the Security Council, and I'll give you briefly my ideas about the subject. But it is not the only needed reform. We need another council. We need a Security Council for economic and social problems. There, we have nothing. We have a variety of institutions, but not one top institution, which could make it possible that the basic beliefs of human beings, women and men alike, and children alike, are really be taken care of. And that could be a council where perhaps the 25 most important nations would come together regularly and look at the problems of finance, of social problems, of democracy, of health problems, education problems, in a joint way. That would be to my mind, and I share this view with Mikhail Gorbachev, who has said the same, and with Jacques Delors, who has also pleaded for such a council, I think these reforms are possible. 
And in our little book, to which I return again, there is one man who knows more about that than any one of us, that's Michael Doyle, who has been working with the Secretary General uh, at Kofi Annan and with Mr. Uh, Ban Ki-moon now. And it is not impossible to think of a reform which would bring new ways of working together, provided the pressure does not come only from governments, but from the people. And that is my answer to the third question. It is true that as long as only governments work out the uh, resolutions and the uh, dictates of the United Nations, then the pressure on governments is not sufficient. Governments want to be re-elected, and in order to be re-elected, they want to do something for their people, and they're not concerned about other people. And very few governments have an open mind to worldwide problems. Some of them have. I feel, for instance, that we are fortunate to have two former heads of government with us in our little group, not only my friend Michel Rocard, but also Milan Kuchan, the first president of Slovenia, who has a very open mind and an open heart. And he, I think, and others would try to do that. But what is really new to me is what has been happening during the past 15 years. Those are the social fora the forum in, uh, uh, in uh, uh, Brazil, in Porto Alegre, in Seattle, the forum that is going to meet around the next World Conference on Environment in Rio in two months, three months from now. That pressure, the pressure of the citizens themselves, is something I think is relatively new. I'm not saying that democracy is something that we have invented five years ago. No, it was invented by a certain Aristoteles, Pericles, and others like that. Uh, but uh, it is, to my mind, essential that the pressure continues to be built on the people, on the citizens, and on their movements, their worldwide movements. I was, of course, uh, immodestly proud that my little book, uh, uh, Time for Outrage, raised so much involvement by young people all over the world. I was not responsible for that, but my book came at a time when this happened. Not only the Arab Spring, but in China and in Russia, things begin to move. This movement of the peoples, and not of the governments only, that, I think, is what must give us a little bit of hope. Uh, the ways and means which, which the younger generation is able now to work and to express its wishes and to make it so that when it really wishes something strongly altogether, then it will arise. That is my message and my hope. Uh, my name is Dominic Petman. I'm visiting from the New School in New York, uh, the Global Communications Department. And uh, I'm fascinated by what I've been hearing, and I just have two very quick questions. Uh, one is about the United Nations in that it is based on nations, and there are many more peoples and states than nations. So I wonder how we deal with indigenous populations, for instance. I mean, the Palestinian question is, is always in the air. Um, so that's, if that's the model we're following and if the world is moving to a post-national uh, phase, then, then what, how, how is this a medium-term solution rather than a long-term solution? Uh, I'm also interested in the link between the first book and the second book because it seems that outrage is giving way to diplomacy and planning and back to the rational. So is it as simple as that, that we become indignant and then we get uh, pragmatic and practical? Or yeah, what is the relationship between, say, the heart and the head here, between emotion and, and 
you know, justifiable fury, and and this this which seems like a more clinical um, architectural um, plan that follows from this. So I, I I'd love to hear more about the bridge between your two projects. I'm Noor Jelani. I'm a first year student here um, doing international politics, and uh, I'm originally from Canada. But I wanted to ask you. Um, what do you think is uh, better to actually put pressure on the government? Do you think that it should be um, like the Occupy Wall Street movement uh, an across the board uh, protest with no limits on uh, say the members or the people involved, i.e. the general population, or do you think that it's better when it's a focused group of people, for example, uh, students protest or um, like racial, like uh, the Black Panther movement. W which one do you think actually makes more of an impact onto the government? My name is Maria and I'm an alum from AUP. I'm now studying a, a master's in development economics in London. And so a lot of these questions come up in our lectures um, very, very um, regularly. And so unfortunately or fortunately, um, my question is about economics. And it refers to your first point, um, your first major problem with the world today, which is the inequality problem, the kind of increasing Gini coefficients um, and the gap between the rich and the poor, which is becoming a, a problem more and more. And my question, and, and you mentioned it several times, is that uh, politicians, when they when they want to <coughs> win and become the president, they will not implement or say that they're going to implement redistribution policies because that will not get them votes. Um, capitalism is also set up in a way that we have to be nice to the people earning money because otherwise we cannot redistribute, we cannot have healthcare programs. Um, and now I know this is a really tough question and, and, and I um, appreciate that it. Th I, d I don't know the solutions myself, but I would like to um, ask you if, if you had any kind of solutions to that, maybe um, changing the incentive structures so as so as that um, politicians actually um, kind of run for the right reasons and, and have long-term interests in the country that they're running in? Uh, obviously, the uh, reflection about uh, uh, how one can overcome uh, the uh, blockage that arises from a, an organization which is run only by government and where other forces than the government are not really alive. It's an important question. I always remind people that Article 71 of the Charter of the United Nations says that we must work together with non-governmental organization. The word non-governmental organization was never mentioned before. It is, comes out of the Article 71 of the Charter of the UN. So it shows you that uh, even the founders were aware that such forces, at the time, we rather thought of such forces as the trade unions, the churches, the cooperatives. We considered them at the time as the movements, the non-governmental movements that should have access to the work of the United Nations. And this does not, did not leave a great deal of work accomplished. But meanwhile, more and more organizations work together internationally, also regionally and nationally, and they can bring pressure even on the institution itself. Therefore, it is possible that the uh, uh, unique unicity of power of nations and their governments and the ignorance of the peoples themselves who are not always uh, already, they don't always already have a nation, and that is the case, for instance, of the people of Palestine who want to have a state but who are not yet admitted as a state in the United Nations. In other words, uh, the complexity of that situation is one which does not lead to immediate and easy answers. We must get used to the complexity of our world, and it is enough to be aware of that, to read the books of my friend and partner Edgar Morin, who has really been the inventor of the word complexity. No, it existed before he wrote about it, but he made it as 
a particular uh, important way to look at how problems can be solved. The problem of nations having the last word or of people being able to express themselves through various forms of non-governmental organization is a problem that can be dealt with only if the thought about humankind is overcoming uh, the simplification, uh, the simplification, for instance, of the markets who tell you the markets know the answer to everything. Just let them work. Uh, don't interfere with them. Governments, leave alone. Uh, occupy yourself with the police and the military. But don't deal with the markets. The result is the poly crisis in which we live now. So there also the complexity of our world leads us to think, yes, we need the nations, we have to put pressure on our governments, but we also make other pressures, pressures on the financial world, pressures on the governmental world. That is my answer, uh, very short, no, not short, but very insufficient to the first question. Let's turn to the second. The second question uh, was regarding how best to pressure governments into acting towards the solutions that you are suggesting. What kinds of protests and what kinds of organizations? Uh, uh, would it be best it for s it'd be student mobilizations or wider mobilizations, uh, centralized political organized, decentralized protest, civil disobedience? What is your idea on that? Uh, yes, and this question came from a student, if I'm yes. right. And it is for me very important to hear students, to hear this generation asking themselves and asking me eventually, uh, how best to go ahead. Should one go ahead with smaller groups uh, dealing with a specific question and trying to make progress on a specific question? Or should one realize that specific questions are so much connected with each other that nothing much can be achieved if one looks only at one particular question. One has to go wider and look at the general context. Yes, but let us not exaggerate. If one drowns oneself in an immense problem and says this is the immense problem that we are going to solve and try to bring people together to solve it, it's a very, very difficult task. I would recommend to the younger generation to choose one of the reasons for them to be outraged. Mm -hmm. That is, was the meaning of my first little book, Indignez vous, Time for Outrage. Look at what you consider to be unacceptable and try to link with people who share the same belief and with them exercise pressure on the authority or whatever that has dealt unacceptably in this particular field. That is, I would say, the way to uh, energize, to dynamize, to mobilize people because when one fees, sees something that is really unacceptable, I'll give you an example of this country. We have had a president who has been very sh severe on one population that exists in many European countries. We call them the Rom. They are the Tsigan, uh, Gitan, or whatever. They have several names. And to try to say we don't want them and we expel them, that is unacceptable. And fortunately, one of their leaders and people who have, uh, Tony Gatliff, have made a marvelous film about them. That is a precise subject on which one can try to work. But obviously, as long as one knows that it is not the only problem, that other problems are also very important, one should deal with one of them and at the same time keep contact with other groups that deal with other unacceptabilities. And that is, I think, the best way to make of oneself a real human being that is a human being with compassion, very important, compassionate human being 
who realize that things are, are unacceptable and that they want to do something about it. And I can tell you, the first time any one of you or us is doing something for somebody who is in difficulty. Doing it is not going to give him a better moral worth. Let's discount that. It's going to make him or her happier because happiness is connected with doing something for somebody else. Wonderful answer. Uh, As you can see, we have a dangerous subversive here tonight. Uh, the third question was on economics and the question of inequality, on whether, uh, given the current capitalist structure of the world, whether the incentive systems in the capitalist system can be changed so as to favor greater equality or greater social fairness, if I got your question correctly. Very fundamental question. Is it just impossible? Many people whom I have met are discouraged because they say the way we are being, uh, being governed by the financial forces against which the governments are helpless and the individuals are helpless. They have to have a job, they have to have a house. How can they fight for a different distribution of wealth and of uh, availabilities. I say <coughs> that fight for greater justice is something that is connected, I would say, with what I call basic values. All our countries, or most of them, have a past mm -hmm. with periods when things were run more efficiently and periods where <coughs> they were not dealt with properly. And when they remind themselves, it is not only to build something completely new that is sometimes extremely difficult to th even think about, but to say, we have had in the years 1960, 1980, let's just say, <coughs> we have had things that have evolved in the right direction, and then they have failed again. Let us think back. Let us not only think forward, we must think forward too, but let us think back and think of periods when something was achieved that made progress for our societies. We will find that. <coughs> and that, I think, will give you an indication as to how to overcome now the exaggerated pressure and the exaggerated uh, <coughs> strengths of the financial markets and of the financialized economy. My name is Hin Lam. I'm a comparative literature student. And as such, I have a question concerning the publication of En Digne Vous. Um, I know this is a more politically oriented debate, but I'm very curious as to how you felt when you were writing it and if you were worried about how people would receive it. And this, I mean, if you can try to put yourself in the state of mind before you knew how popular um, it, it's turned out to be. Um, thank you. My name is Rachel Haile Selassie, and I am a master's student here at American University of Paris. And I heard your heed for uh, economic and social um, counsel um, to address, in what my mind, are um, issues of gender inequality. And I also hear your call for compassion to to be a call for the skills that might be um, uh, brought forth by women. Um, I find gender, gender inequality um, unacceptable. And so I'm wondering what your advice is um, moving forward in global leadership for um, women and other um, marginalized communities. My name is Avinia. I'm uh, an economics and communications major and minoring in math. I come from Romania, so when you mentioned about the Roma citizens, I was actually, I mean, that really triggered my attention because many people associate my country with that and I realize how big of a problem it is. How would you find, uh, what, what solution would you find for it? Because their culture is so <coughs> difficult to explain, 
that it's very hard to find an answer to, to that problem. So, thank you. Well, Marc Nerfin, when he had uh, this International Foundation for Another Development, he suggested that in the United Nations there would be a third body, because the charter says we, the people of the United Nations, a third body who would represent the people of the, uh, of the countries, like in fact what they do now in the forums. Now I would like just to, uh, you, you give your, uh, your, your idea on that. The first question was, uh, uh, when you were writing Indignez-vous, uh, uh, what kind of political reaction did you expect at the point where that you were writing it? Did you expect the kind of reaction that you actually got? To that question, the answer is simple. I did not accept, I did not uh, uh, expect, <coughs> expect uh, anything more than some uh, mobilizing of my compatriots, the French, uh, who had the, the memory of the resistance and who found that our present government does not lead up to the values that were then put forward by the National Council of the Resistance. And I was hap so thinking happily that there would be many Frenchmen who were still had the memory of our resistance period and he would be happy to read a little book. What happened was completely unexpected to me. Uh, the book was, uh, it took interest in other countries. It was translated into 35 languages. And therefore, it became a symbol of the overall anguish of people in many countries, not only in Romania, also in Romania, but also in many other countries where the feeling was we are not being governed the way we would like to be governed. Well, that was very important. Now, I share no responsibility for the Arab Spring or for the Greek uh, risings. Uh, it was not my fault, <laughs> but the little book came at a time when this appeared all over many places, and therefore, of course, I was extremely happy to see it being sent all over. The last edition of it, which has just come out, is going to be in Hebrew. And I'm particularly happy that a marvelous lady by the name of Nurit Pelet, for whom I have great admiration, is going to write an introduction in Hebrew. So that was that is my answer to this first question. Yes, one never knows what's going to happen to one for one's work. I have written now in the last years so many articles and books and all over the place, it's terrible. But this little one, this little time for outrage that this was translated into English, uh, has had an extraordinary effect. I can only be, ha be thankful for those who are not only reading it, but are turning to me and telling me, oh, thank you. Thank you. Second question. The second question regarded the, the issue of gender inequality as part of global inequality. Uh, gender inequality is an important issue uh, for the United Nations and for society in general. Uh, what would you have to say about you know, global action on gender inequality? Well, I would say that if there's one thing uh, of which I am happy and partly proud because I've been with that movement is the enormous efforts made by women to get their gender taken into account as it must be taken into account. And we men are guilty for having had centuries and, th and millenniums where we did not uh, take the uh, good things that come from women as part of our common wisdom. I have had the chance, the good luck, to work from time to time for women who were my uh, presidents or my masters, and that is a very positive experience. I do feel, but I won't be too long on that because it is a tremendously important subject, that between the uh, psyche of uh, women and the psyche of men, there must be a combination that will allow us to do what Edgar Morin expects us to do. I'll tell you, be careful now. He expects us to
to behave like the little little chenille, the little who uh, pillar, yes, caterpillar, 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 who are first, the, the, and then suddenly they evolve and they become, they become butterflies. Mm -hmm. Is it possible for us, bringing the two genders to work together, to go beyond our selfish little uh, way of behaving and to become at last butterflies. Now that, I think, is a way to look at the future which gives us hope. Uh, maybe we won't become butterflies, but we could become real, well-trained human beings. And that we can be only if the two genders learn to work together with mutual respect and with bringing together the advantages of the one and of the other. The third question concerned the, uh, the Roma. Yeah. And, and, and the question came from a Romanian student who's here and, and asked you what kind of solution you think would be possible for uh, this, this population, given the complexity of the situation. It is a uh, very interesting problem which can be dealt with with great care. If one deals with it by saying these people have their way of living and they are not accustomed to our way of living and therefore wherever we find them, we find difficulties. They become delinquents because they're not used to work with others as we are used to. Then uh, there is a shadow put on them and that shadow cannot be lifted easily. But it can be lifted because wherever the question of space is dealt with, with intelligence, what to do with these uh, civilizations, these cultures? They are culture, they are musical and poetical and uh, gymnastically uh, well-trained people. And they can bring a lot wherever space is made available to them. And of course, we all need space. And sometimes villages will say we have no space here. But a good government is one that will have a plan a space plan for the Rom civilization and allow them to live their way and not to be in, to put difficulties to the rest of the population. I agree it is not easy. I have full sympathy with the places where this question is not well solved, but I put it as a fact that it can be solved. And it has been solved. And I must say that my country, uh, I have lots of criticism, but I have also sometimes a great respect. We have been able in France during long years to have a, a Gitan population that was at ease in France in its various parts. And that does not put the same problem as that that has arisen when Europe has been enlarged, when Romania, Ung Hungary, and other countries have come in where ROMs are frequent. Uh, so it is a problem, but it can be solved. And now we come to the last question. About the, the third assembly of the United Nations that was proposed uh, by Marc uh, <coughs> Nerfin, of the, an assembly of the peoples of the world. Uh, Obviously, uh, Marc Nerfin, like uh, Brian Urquhart and many other of my friends and colleagues, have had good ideas about what can be done to improve the United Nations. The idea, the basic idea, is that if it's only governments uh, that are uh, there, or if it's only financial pressures that work on the uh, IBRD and the IMF, uh, then something is missing. And Nerfer was quite right in saying what is missing is the people themselves. We have already dealt partly this tonight with this problem, thinking about the forum, social forum, uh, or the NGOs movement, the human rights NGOs, etc. They have. Can one go further? Can one have 
some sort of an international body. But who would be there? Who would be the responsible people? It is not easy to have responsibility made from particular people. How can the people express themselves? This is something on which we must continue to work. I think there are progresses made uh, in each of the great international conferences. And let me just quote uh, about this question, two, two questions before. The great conference in Beijing on women, 1995, which was a step in the direction of making wi women more looked at and thought of, uh, there must be ways. The next step anyhow uh, would be after the great international uh, uh, conference on uh, environment, which is going to take place in Rio in uh, two months, uh, to make sure that there the influence of the people themselves in their various manifestations will be felt to such an extent that governments will have to do something. <laughs>